want to have it all and we want to have it all right now unfortunately there are limits to what we can have and this is where the trade-off happens and in order to get what we ultimately want we have to trade in something else for example you can have a great savings account but the trade-off is that you have to have a financial budget um, you can have a great physical physique but the trade-off is you have to eat right and exercise it's the same with you you can end up with almost anything that you want in this life but in order to get it you cannot have it all we all want it all but you cannot have it all something has to give and this is where the trade-off comes in Welcome to Next Level Church Online. Our service is gonna begin in just a few moments, but before it does, I wanna share some information of how you can get the most out of it. The first is we're here for you. We have hosts that are going to be here to help you in the chat. Uh, if you wanna engage in the chat or if you want someone to pray with you. If you're watching from our online platform, you'll see a button that says live prayer. You click that button and it will take you to a private chat with one of our hosts. If you happen to be watching through Facebook, if you send us a direct message, we'll be back with you to pray with you at any point during this service. Well, maybe you're wondering what you're going to expect during this experience. Well, it's pretty simple. First, we're going to have our band. They're going to uh, lead us in a time of worship and singing. The lyrics are going to come up on the screen so that you can participate. Then you're going to hear from our lead pastor as he teaches us from the Bible for our current series. And then you also have someone sharing about some potential next steps that you can take. So sit back, grab your cup of coffee, and let's get ready in just a few moments to worship God together. Well, hey there, and welcome to Next Level Online. Thanks so much for spending part of your weekend with us. My name is Eric, and I'll be with you throughout this experience. We're going to get some things kicked off here today in just a few moments with the band. They're going to be leading us at a time of singing, and I hope that you'll engage in worship however you feel comfortable. If you're new with us, we want you to feel at home and know that this is a safe place, and we're so glad that you're here. For us, church is so much more than just a Sunday service, and we want you to know that there's a place that's perfect for you at Next Level. 
And one of the best ways to get connected with us is by taking the Stick for Three Challenge. At any point today or throughout this week, if you text the word WELCOME to the number on the screen, that will let us know that today was your first time, and as a thank you, we will send you a free ebook that is all about building the best relationships possible. For now, let's join in with the band and sing together. Nothing else will do. I 
Dear God, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the opportunity to give you praise. God, please forgive us for the times that we've taken your presence for granted. We will always give you praise just for who you are. In your name we pray, amen. Thanks so much for worshiping with us today. Well, for the month of November, we are partnering with Little Bricks Charity in order to make a difference by sending Lego sets to kids that have to have extended stays in the hospital. In addition to raising funds, we are also trying to spread the word by participating in the Brick Walk Challenge. Well, if you were here last week, I showed you how to do the Brick Walk Challenge, but today I wanna to show you that you are never too old or too young to participate. So why don't we check out Reese as she shows us how to do the Brick Walk Challenge. All right. All right. Ready, go. Oh man, look at her go. So fast. Keep going. Don't stop. It hurts when you stop. Keep, Keep going. going. Keep going. You're almost there. You're almost there. Yeah. Done. Reese did an awesome job, and I know that you can do it too. And don't forget, even if you don't film yourself doing the Brick Walk Challenge, you can still give directly by visiting nextlevelchurch.net slash give and choose the Make a Difference Fund. All guests will go to support Little Bricks Charity. Well, last year was our inaugural year for the Next Level Christmas Light Show, and we can't wait for this year's show. Be sure to mark your calendars for December 1st so that you and your families and your neighbors and friends can join us as we kick off the 2020 Light Show. We'll have some hot chocolate and refreshments, so be sure to make plans to join us at 6.30 on December 1st. With all that being said, we are continuing in week two of our current message series, The Trade-Off. So let's check this out together. Ruth traded her homeland to become the great-grandmother to a king. Moses and David traded their sheep to become leaders of Israel. Saul traded his prestige to become Paul, a leader of the church. Corey Ten Boon traded anger and resentment to forgive a brutal Nazi guard who put his faith in Christ. Cameron traded the money he spent on Starbucks for 40 days to raise money for water wells for Uganda. They put their faith in action. Being intentional with time, resources, and passions so that they could bring the love of Christ to the world. What are you willing to trade? Let's welcome our lead pastor, Rob. Today we're continuing our series, The Trade-Off, and it's based off the idea that we want to have it all, and we want to have it now, but we can't. Life is made up of a series of choices. Uh, last week on week one, we covered the big idea, which was you can pay the price now or you can pay later, but you'll pay more if you pay later. It's this idea of that you can eventually get the things that you want. You just can't have them instantly. And if you want something long term, you got to put in the time. You got to put in the effort. And I see this in, in majorly in areas where I'm I'm not just I'm not naturally great at things like like, for example, when it comes to watching what I eat, to a, to a diet, to having that type of balance, most days during the day, I am very good and I am disciplined. I don't know if anyone else can relate to this. Like I, I plan it ahead of time. I think through it. I try to eat right. But at night, that's a different story. 
and at night, especially if I've had a hard day, my discipline tends to go out the window. That if I come home from a stressful day, all I want to do is just, I want, I want something easy. I want something that I don't have to think about. I want something that's going to give me instant relief or instant gratification. And oftentimes my discipline goes out the window because my day has been difficult. Whether it's a diet, a budget, or having healthy relationships, it all comes down to a strategy. It all comes down to following a plan and executing that plan. Strategy is, ma- is about making choices, trade-offs. It's about deliberately choosing to be different. I love that quote by Michael Porter. A strategy, whether it is a diet or a budget or, or relationships, whatever strategy you pick, you get the results when you execute that, stra- that strategy. And it's simply about trade-offs. It's, it's just about trade-offs. And I don't know about you, but I do better in my own life when I have a system in place and I can operate within the parameters of that system. It's so tough to be disciplined, but in some ways it's amazing because the decision has already been made for you. When you say I'm going to follow a diet plan, the decision's already made for you. I'm, I just got to stick to the plan. When you say you're going to follow a budget whether it's Dave Ramsey's or some other type of budget, the decision's already made for you. I'm just going to stick to the plan. When you follow a relationship advice or relationship system, the strategy's already planned out for you. You just got to run the play. It's like in sports. You've already thought of the play. You've already thought of what you're going to do. You just got to execute. Follow the plan and you'll get the results. That is, that's the system. But I don't know about you, but I often get exhausted because I don't have a system and I'm constantly having to make decisions and I'm constantly having to make decisions and it just gets, gets me to feel worn out. It just makes me feel exhausted. In fact, when I get home from work and I'm tired from making decisions, this is what psychologists call decision fatigue. Decision fatigue is the more choices we are forced to make, the more the quality of our decisions deteriorates, right? So this is why discipline goes out the window. When I'm forced to make decisions all day long, at nighttime, I no longer want to make decisions. I just want to do whatever is going to instantly make me feel better or feel good. It's why when I'm stressed, I shouldn't go shopping, all right? It's when I'm, when I'm stressed, I, I should not order a pizza. When I'm stressed, I should not do these things because I'm going to make poor decisions. The more choices we are forced to make, the more the quality of our decisions deteriorate. And let, let, let's take something simple like, what do you want to eat, right? If there is a system in place, it just makes it easy. This is what I'm, eat, I'm going to eat. It's already planned for me. It shouldn't be that hard to make a decision about where we're going to eat. And yet, this sign that I saw in front of NN Burger is so accurate. A picture is going to come up on your screen. 90% of a relationship is figuring out where to eat. I thought that was funny. And isn't it true? Why is it so difficult for us to decide where to eat? If you're in a relationship or if you have kids and you're trying to figure out a place to eat, it is so tough. It typically goes like this. Where do you want to eat? I don't know. Where do you want to eat? Okay, let's go to Mexican. Well, I don't want Mexican. Well, I thought you said you didn't care. I don't care. I just don't want Mexican. Okay, let's do Italian. I don't want Italian. Okay, well, what do you want? I don't know. I don't care. Just pick it. Okay, I want burgers. Nope, I don't want burgers. Well, what do you want? Just tell me what you want. It is so difficult. It is so difficult making these choices. Why? Because we are exhausted from making so many decisions. Can I get an amen? How much energy do we exhaust making simple decisions like where are we going to eat? I I saw this uh, on on Twitter uh, a while ago, and I took a screenshot of it because I thought it was was brilliant. Um, the, The tweet says, my coworker said he doesn't ask his girlfriend where she wants to eat. He just says, guess where we're going to eat. And the first thing she guesses is where they go. Smart man, take notes. That is brilliant. That man right there is playing chess and the rest of us are playing checkers. That guy is a genius. Try it. See if it works next time. Right? But we all have this in common because we are overwhelmed with decisions. We're making so many decisions that it makes even the littlest decision difficult. And this is the beauty of following Jesus. The decision's already been made for you. 
Jesus came to give us a system. It's a system that tells us how we should play the game. It's a system that tells us how we should react in life. It's a system that helps us figure out how to make decisions. So think of it this way. God is a spiritual food source for your soul. You can skip meals. You can fast for an extended period of time. But if you want to survive, you got to eat a meal at some point. And Jesus is clear on this. The trade-off is that we either can find fullness in our souls or emptiness. And Jesus promised that it'll be worth it. If we follow him, it'll be worth it. But we got to understand that he was implementing a system. For week two, I want to show you how important this decision is for you to follow Jesus. And we're going to do that through our scripture. I want to give you our main theme verse for today. The theme verse, I try to always pick it out. It's the one that really highlights our big idea. It's one that I would encourage you to try to memorize or to think about throughout the week. You can write it down and post it someplace where you'll see it. Or if you want to share it online, share it. Feel free to share it on Facebook or or Instagram. But this is the main verse of where we're going today. And at Next Level Church, we want to honor the text. And we do that by reading it nice and loud. And so I want to invite you, wherever you're watching this at, to read uh, John 15, 4 with me nice and loud. Now, when we get to the reference, we like to have a little bit of fun. It's something original that we do. I don't know anyone else that does this, but it's just our way of having fun. The reference is John 15, 4. You'll see two dots. They are called a colon, and I feel like that is awkward to say in church. So instead of saying uh, John 15, colon, 4, we say dot, dot. And I want to invite you to do that with us as well. Will you read it with me nice and loud? It says... Remain in me, and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. John 15, dot, dot, four. Now that we've read the text, let's go to God in prayer. God, uh, there's so much going on in our world, and there's so much going on in each and every one of our brains. There's so much going on right now. In fact, some of us that are watching this are trying to multitask while we're watching this service. And I just ask God that you would just speak to us, that you would help us to to focus our minds and our hearts and that we would want to listen to you. And I ask that you would speak to us and that you give us the courage to obey you no matter how hard it is. God, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, you are my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're gonna look at one of Jesus's most clear and crucial illustrations. But in order to get this illustration, uh, you need to understand something about agriculture or farming. Um, and now, and now I want to say this before we get into this. This is such a clear illustration of what it means to follow Jesus and to follow God. And if you're watching this and you're not a Christian, I think it's awesome that you're checking this out. I think it's so cool. In fact, I would encourage you to watch every week of this series if you're not a Christian, because Jesus is going to clearly outline what the trade-off is. What is the advantage of following him versus the advantage of not following him? And then you get to make your decision if if it's worth the trade-off in your life. So Jesus uh, talks about, he gives us this agricultural illustration. And if you've ever gone apple picking, if you've ever been to Carter's Mountain, uh, you know, over in the Charlottesville area, if you've ever been to a vineyard, um, you know, I do a lot of weddings these days at vineyards. People are getting married at vineyards left and right. If you've ever been someplace where there is fruit growing on a vine or a tree, you are immediately going to understand what Jesus is saying. If you've never done that and you've only gotten fruit from the grocery store, then I need to communicate with you that fruit does not grow in the grocery store. It grows outside on trees and vines and it has to be transported to the grocery store. Now that we're all on the same page, let's look at what Jesus said. John 15, 1. Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Now, there are some cultural things that we need to understand in order to get the most out of, of the, the, this verse. The term, I am, is a reference to God. Specifically, in the Old Testament part of the scriptures, there was a guy by the name of Moses. If you grew up in church, you're probably very familiar with Moses. Moses was the guy who led God's people out of slavery, out from Egypt. And before he did that, he saw a burning bush. And when he comes upon the bush, he sees and realizes that the bush is none other than the presence of God. And in their day and age and in their culture, there were a plethora of gods. There were gods for everything. There was a God for agriculture. There was a God to control the weather. There was a God for, I mean, literally everything. Your dead ancestors could become gods. There were thousands of gods. 
So the first question a person would ask when they came upon a God is, what's your name? That's an important question to know because you have to know how, who am I serving? Who am I praying to? You have to understand and how to differentiate between the various gods. And so Moses says to, to this burning bush when he realizes it's God, well, what should I call you? What is your name? And God replies, I am. So Moses replies, I am. That is the name of God. So for the people of God, the Israelites from the Old Testament through Jesus's period, this idea of I am became a reference to God. It was, it was a term that had a lot of reverence, a lot of weight to it. In fact, the first time that people try to kill Jesus, it's because he says, I am. He refers to the fact that he is not just a prophet. He is not just a preacher. He is not a good, just a good teacher. He is not just a rabbi. He is literally saying, I am God. We're one and the same. We are connected. As you've heard of God the Father, I am God the Son. We're on the same playing field. Now, this is incredibly important, and this is something that you need to understand. When Jesus is saying, I am, he is saying, when you choose to follow me, you are going to follow my systems. Who gets to decide uh, what, what values, the things that we should value? God. If you don't follow God, then follow a different system. You're not, you're not bound to follow his system. Or, but if you follow God, if you follow God, then Jesus is saying you got to follow his teachings. And so this is a system for us. So when it comes to how do we treat people, it's already been figured out for us. We don't have to make a choice. How do we treat people? Jesus said, treat others the way that you want to be treated, not how you're feeling. So the way that I treat other people, it's already been decided for me. I don't have to pray about it. I don't have to think about it. I know. How should I treat someone else? Well, how would I want to be treated if roles were reversed? Jesus has already given us the system. So Jesus says, I am, which is a reference to the fact that he is God. He is, he is one in the same. He then says that I am the true vine. Now, the thing that we might miss about this is that the vine was often a term that God gave to the Israelites, specifically in the Old Testament. And often when he talks about the vine, he talks about the bad fruit, that there were a lot of people who said, I follow God, but yet when you looked at their life, they didn't have things. They didn't have fruit that looked like God. They were, they were mean to one another. They were cruel to one another. They, they were backbiting. They were, they were gossiping. They were trying to kill one another. That the fruit didn't represent the, the, the source, God. And so when Jesus says that I am the true vine, what he's saying is the other vines that you've looked at, they've led to corruption. They've led to, to difficulties. They've, they've led to all sorts of stress. But what you need to understand is that I am the true vine. I am God and I am the vine. In fact, this is probably a reference to Isaiah 5. If you love studying the scriptures, I recommend that you go look up Isaiah 5. It is uh, the vineyard song in which God talks about this, this vine idea, and Jesus is probably referencing that here. So in other words, Jesus is making a declarative statement that he is God. Stick with me on this, okay? Let's keep reading. John 15, 2. Jesus says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does not bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. All right, this is where we have to dig into the scripture a little bit, all right? I want to make sure that you're tuning in. Don't multitask through this. Make sure you're paying attention. In life, we are often blinded by instant gratification, and we only see what is temporarily in front of us. We want something, and we want it now. Often because of instant gratification, because how we're wired, we miss out on the big picture. For example, do you ever say the phrase, I don't have time? Right? That's a phrase that a lot of people say. A, a lot of us say, I just don't have time. And most of the time we, we say that for, uh, as like an excuse for not doing the things that we're supposed to do, right? So like, don't judge me because I didn't exercise. I don't have time to exercise. Don't judge me because I didn't budget my money. I don't have time to budget my money. Don't judge me because I didn't read my Bible. I'm so busy, I don't have time. A few years ago, I made a conscious decision to stop saying the phrase, I don't have time. Because here's the truth of the matter. 
If you've gotten on Facebook, you have time. If you watch Netflix, you have time. If you have had a conversation at work around the water cooler that didn't have anything to do with work, you have time. If you've watched sports, you have time. If you've tuned in to politics and watched 24-hour news channel, you have time. We have time. The problem is not that we don't have time. The problem is we've chosen something other than what we are supposed to do. So I don't use the phrase, I don't have time. I use the phrase, I didn't make time. I didn't make time to exercise. I didn't make time to eat right. I didn't make time to read my Bible. I didn't make time. We do the things that we are most passionate about. In life, there are no solutions. There's only trade-offs. That's a, a quote from Thomas Sowell. He's an economist. And uh, that is, that's exactly what we're talking about. In life, there, there are no solutions. There's just trade-offs. And in, when you say, I don't have time, what you are communicating is, I've made a trade-off. I chose Netflix over spending time with God. I chose spending my money however I wanted to over a budget. I chose being lazy over prioritizing relationships and being intentional about it. I made a decision. It's a trade-off. And saying I don't have time is often, and it's often an excuse. Um, I, I, I was asked after I published my, my third book how I have time to do that. And there were multiple people asked me this. They said, like, you're, you're a pastor of a church. Um, you're on social media a lot and, and have a platform on social media. Um, you've got, you know, twin kids at home. You've got a wife. You have uh, friends and a social life. And like, how did you make time to write a book? And, or how did you have time? And the answer is I, I made time for it. I had to prioritize writing over other things. So there were times where um, instead of watching television, I sat down and I worked on the book. There were times when I went into the office early, an hour before everyone else got in there, to write the book. So I said no to something else. There was a trade-off. My fourth book is about 70% done, and it's been about 70% done for months now. The reason that my fourth book has not been published and not been finished is because I've made a trade-off. The trade-off is a little app called TikTok. I love making videos on TikTok. It's, it's fun to me. I have 146 thousand followers on TikTok. It's a lot of fun. In fact, I've made real friends from this little app called TikTok. And I don't feel bad about it. I don't make it as an excuse, but I have to be honest about it. I haven't finished my fourth book because I made a trade-off to spend time on an app. And in your life, so often, you make an excuse for the decisions that you've made. And what we need to do is look at the trade-off. It's not that I, I, I didn't have the ability to do it, I just chose something else. It's not that I, I didn't have um, the, a chance to do it, I just chose something else. And I'll tell you, I tell you all that to say that if you look at something about your life and you don't like it, it is because of the system you've decided to adopt. If you don't like your financial situation, then I would ask you to look at the system in which you've adopted. Do you follow a budget? It doesn't mean it's gonna, it, it's easy or that money's gonna, you know, you, you may be in a tight financial situation, but you gotta look at the system of how you spend your money. If you look at unhealthy relationships and you have unhealthy relationships, you can't control other people, but you can look at the system in which you interact with people. It's not easy being disciplined. In fact, it stinks so often to be disciplined. But anything in our life that is a distraction from Jesus, Jesus says that he prunes, that he, he cuts it off. He takes it down. He cuts off anything that is, is a distraction. And so what we need to understand as followers of Jesus is that Jesus is asking us to be fully committed to his system. And anything in our life that is not fully committed to Jesus, we need to know he is coming with the scissors to cut it, to prune it. Now, uh, this, is, uh, this goes on. Jesus says in John 15, 3, you are already clean because the word I have spoken to you. Now, I don't have a lot of time to spend on this, but I want to cover this quickly because sometimes there have been churches and pastors who have used this verse to preach that if you don't always follow Jesus, then he's going to cut you off and you're going to lose your salvation and, and you're done. And 
that it's all based on the results of, of how you live for him. And so if you've made a big, massive mistake or you've made a conscious decision at some point to disobey Jesus, then he's going to come and cut you off and, and you're going to burn and, and, and go to hell. And I want to make sure that you understand this verse is so important to how we understand the whole context around what Jesus is saying. Jesus says, you are already clean. In other words, another word for this is you've already been pruned. You've already been cut. You've already, you've already been chosen to be a part of the vine because you've believed the words that I've spoken. And so when Jesus says that he is going to prune or cut off anything in our life that doesn't have fruit, he's not saying he's cutting us off. He's saying he's cutting off the, the things in our life that don't look like him. This is discipline. And what stinks is, it stinks to be disciplined. I've never met a kid who enjoyed being disciplined by their parents. I've never met an athlete who enjoyed being disciplined by their coach. I've never met a student who enjoyed being disciplined by the teacher. But the reality is, when you're in authority, when people don't do what they are supposed to do, there is a, uh, there's, there's a bit of discipline that happens. And what God and what Jesus is saying is that if you're a Christian and following him, there's some discipline, there's some pruning, there's some times when, when difficult things happen because Jesus wants us to become more like him. But it doesn't mean that he cuts us off. You cannot lose God's love. You can't. If you're a part of the tree, you're always a part of the tree. You can't lose God's love. No cap. I learned that phrase on TikTok. You cannot lose God's love. You cannot, God doesn't come and say, oh, you messed up. Boom, you're gone. You're out of here. You're a part of the vine. You're already clean. You've already been pruned because you believed in Jesus. But let's see what Jesus says next. John 15, 4. Remain in me and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. This is the, the carte blanche. This is the main course. This is the final countdown. This is, this is the main idea. This is the main point. This is what it's all about. The word that we have translated remain is better translated by the word abide. When the scripture, when Jesus said, remain in me, what he is actually saying is, abide in me. Well, what does it mean to abide? That's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Abide means to dwell in. That's what it means to abide. It means to find your home in. It means to live in. It, it, it means that, that, that we're going to lodge, to, to take our comfort, to take our joy, to take our, our, our brains to Jesus, that we are going to to live in, that we are going to not live in our own strength, we're going to live in the strength of God, that we're not going to make decisions based off what feels good, we're going to make decisions based off what honors God, that we're going to, to think about things that honor God over things that honor ourselves. To abide in means simply to dwell in. So this makes it so easy for us as Christians. Either you are abiding in Jesus or you're not. You don't have to make the decision. Like, you don't have to decide, hey, today am I going to live for Jesus or not? No, if you're a Christian, you're going to live for Jesus. You don't have to make, you don't have to make a, a, a tough decision. Should I, should I read my Bible today or not? No, if you're living for Jesus, you're going to read your Bible. You shouldn't have to even wrestle with, should I go to church? If you're a Christian, that's, what it, what, that's a part of being a Christian. I'm going to abide in Jesus. And that takes us to our big idea. Our big idea is Christians... Make time to abide in Christ. Christians make time to abide in Christ. And this changes everything. Because so often, at least what I see from, from people who say they follow Christ, for, from Christians, so often what I see is that people act like the things about following Jesus are optional. So often we treat Jesus like he's an accessory. Right? Like, like Jesus is a purse or a belt or like this puffy vest that I have, this puffy vest. I made a decision to put on this puffy vest today. It was kind of cold outside. I made this decision. And so we treat Jesus like this puffy vest. We say, okay, based off how I'm feeling, I'm either going to wear this or I'm not. But that's not how Jesus operates at all. 
Jesus is not an accessory. He's a life source. And Jesus said that he is the vine. He's the tree. So Christians, we have to make time to abide in Christ because he is our food source. He is our life. If your soul is feeling empty, it's because you've looked for a food source other than Jesus. If you're not feeling close to God, it's because you've moved, not because he has. And here's the problem so often. Because abiding in Jesus is like trees, it's like seeds, it's a slow process. We often don't see the results of whether or not we are abiding in Christ for a long period of time. Like here's, here's, here's practically speaking what this is saying. If you go to an apple orchard and you pick an apple, the second that you pull it from the tree, it's starting to die. But it doesn't die instantly, right? You can have it in a basket on your table for a little while. But eventually, because you've pulled it from the food source, because you pulled it from the tree, eventually it's going to rot. And what I see happen so often in Christians' lives is that because we don't see instant failure, we cut off the food source. When you, when you choose to not prioritize church and you choose to not prioritize God, there's a trade-off. But the trade-off doesn't happen instantly. It's not like if you miss church once, your life's going to completely fall apart. But you need to take Jesus seriously at his words. He is the life source for our souls. And so the question is, are you abiding in Jesus or are you not? It's not optional for Christians. So if you can't physically get to a church service, you've got to think through, okay, well, how else do I prioritize this? If, if you can't physically read a Bible, you've got to figure out, well, how else do I prioritize making sure that Scripture is in my life? If you can't physically get around other Christians, you've got to figure out, okay, how do I prioritize and make sure that they're in my life? Because all of this stuff around Christianity, prayer, reading the Bible, Christian fellowship, all of that is a part of the process of abiding in God. And at the end of the day, what we have to look at is not the results of our decisions that happen right in front of us. What we need to look at is long-term, what is the fruit? And the decisions that you're making, they are a direct result of or the, the, the consequences of your life, they're a direct result of the decisions that you've made. Jesus is our food source. He's our water. He's our life. And the trade-off is that when we obey Jesus, we receive love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. But it's not like the matrix in where you get this stuff downloaded in your head instantly. It's like a seed. It's like a plant. It's like an orchard. It takes time to grow. And when we abide in Jesus, when we make our home in Jesus, when we live for Jesus, we start to produce fruit. So how do you tell if someone is abiding in Jesus? They bear fruit. Well, what is the fruit? This is to, to wrap up. I just want to quickly give you something to get you to think about. I want you to analyze this. All right. I want you to think about long term in your life. Is your life producing fruit? Well, what is the fruit of abiding in Jesus? According to Jesus, this is the fruit. Number one, you love God by obeying him. So look at the actions of your life. Look at, at your day to day. Do you find yourself obeying Jesus? If not, then at some point you've cut yourself from the food source. You've, you've been abiding in something else. Number two, the fruit of abiding in Jesus is that we love people by how we treat, by how, by how we treat them. If you want to know the fruit of following Jesus, it always comes down to these two things, loving God and loving people. That means loving people that we disagree with. That means that loving people that are mean to us. That doesn't mean that we let them be mean to us. We can set up boundaries. We can walk away from it or we can try to protect ourselves, but we protect ourselves from hating other people. In fact, Jesus is very clear that we are to pray for our enemies we don't hate our enemies. We don't hope for destruction on our enemies. We pray for them that they find Jesus, that their lives are changed. Why? Because the system that we follow with, with Jesus, it changes everything. Ultimately, it changes how we view God and how we view other people. The fruit of abiding in Jesus is to love God by obeying him and love people by how we treat them. And this is so important because Jesus would say we can't do these things 
apart from Him. We, can't, we don't have the strength to forgive other people all the time if we're not abiding in Jesus. We don't have the strength to be unselfish if we're not abiding in Jesus. We don't have the strength in our own. We may do it one or two days, but when our discipline is weak, we don't have the strength ourselves. That's why it's so important to abide in Jesus. That's why our big idea is so important. Christians make time to abide in Christ. Christians make time to abide in Jesus. Why? Because he's our source. He's our life. He is everything to us. Today's win. When you look at the fruit of your life, does it point back to Jesus? Either we're abiding in Jesus or we're not. And the way that we can tell is by examining the fruit of our life. Do I have a desire to obey Jesus and follow Jesus? Do I have a desire to love other people, even people I disagree with? If not, check the source. Are we abiding in Jesus or not? Will you pray with me? God, we come before you and we ask in Jesus' name that you would speak to us, that you would do the work that we cannot do on our own. And God, we ask that you would just help us to think about and to be drawn in and to rely on you as the source of our life. God, we cannot do this on our own, but we can do it because you have loved us and you've done it for us. We thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for being with us today. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week by checking out nextlevelchurch.net and also connect with us on Facebook or Instagram at nextlevel757. And if you're interested in joining us for an in-person service, we are currently offering those services at 8.30, 10 a.m. and 11.30 each week. Yet, no matter if you join us online or in person, we believe that God has something unique to say to you, and our hope is that you feel His love stronger today than ever before. Thanks again for being with us. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week.